You, me, and HIFMB. Stories of science and the sea. Hey, hey, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the HIFMB podcast. And Happy New Year to all of you. I hope you all had a nice Christmas break and we're getting right into the thick of it again with our podcast. And this time with Jana Massing, who uh, brings to us one of the most complex and theoretical topics we've probably talked about uh, before. So not only are we for the first time talking about bacteria on this channel, we're also for the first time uh, talking about uh, biodiversity theory. The biodiversity theory group is one here led by Thilo Groß. Diana is one of Thilo's PhD students and she brings to us uh, one of her publications, which is currently in resubmission and should be published quite soon, hopefully. Um, and this is on a method that she applied to the bacterial community of the Baltic Sea. Uh, the method is called diffusion maps, which is a, a manifold learning technique. So without further ado, I give you Jana Massing. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the HFMB podcast. And today I have Jana Massing with us. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. From the th uh, uh, Theory in Biodiversity group? Biodiversity theory, yeah. Bi biodiversity <laughs> theory. That's the way. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, so today we want to uh, uh, talk about one of your uh, publications or your most recent one, I think. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, submitted currently. Yeah, re exactly. it's resubmitted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Um, so this is, uh, uh, the, the title is a mouthful. It's Quantification of Metabolic Niche Occupancy Dynamics in the Baltic Sea Bacterial Community. So is this your, your first contact with bacteria? So it's the first time we're talking um, in the podcast about bacteria, but is it your first? Yeah, so it kind of started when I started my PhD. So I mean, I, I studied marine biology, which also involves, of course, marine microbes and bacteria. Yeah. But I think now it's the first time I really got in like close contact and uh, into depth with microbes <laughs> yeah okay how, how long have you been working on this on this study oh i um i'm not sure maybe like i i'm two two years yeah. i'm not sure yeah yeah okay yeah. all right so because i mean of course you always do you submit right and then it takes some time and exactly, then you do yeah. other projects yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> submit resubmit you get reviews back and then it yeah it, it stretches for sure you're a phd student at hifmb and but this isn't your first uh publication no exactly so bef so it's actually the first project i worked on but in between we published also a review on generalized modeling yeah yeah, yeah that's one thing while you're doing your phd you're doing many things in parallel and then other things go by faster than, than yeah. yeah and what's the status of the of the study it's it's resubmitted and and uh submitted where in which journal m systems that is a sub journal of american society for microbiology so oh, okay i mean we use this new method and we hope that that people will use it in the future for yeah. on their data yeah. yeah let's get into that so um the new method that you talk about is called manifold learning or it's called diffusion maps yeah so manifold learning is like the the category maybe of yeah. the method right okay, okay right <laughs> and then diffusion maps is the method that we use mm -hmm. um yeah the specific method name so it's a it's a uh it's a modeling method not not uh, mathematical modeling not statistical modeling or uh no it's actually a manifold learning approach with which means or in this case it's a dimensionality reduction method oh yes so okay. <laughs> yeah so maybe uh, i think a lot of people know pca which is uh principal component analysis right yeah. so basically you have high dimensional data and you're trying to reduce this dimensionality to better understand the system you have okay and yeah i imagine uh, bacteria from the baltic sea are quite highly dimensional the the data you get on them yes. um, <laughs> so i guess yeah so um in the study you're kind of um the the core to, uh, to me reading the abstract correct me if i'm wrong um, is that you want to link community dynamics with um, ecosystem functioning for, uh, I, I guess, one of the uh, first times for, for bacteria? Oh, I'm not sure. I think yeah. especially if, if, you, if people have looked at, at like the uh, E. coli, all right, or yeah, these, yeah. These, these single species, I think they have done already a great job in, mm -hmm. in, in analyzing for 
what the bacteria is important in the system, right? It is in, or if we think about gut bacteria, I think. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, especially in marine systems, it's quite complicated because you have these open systems, right? Mm-hmm. Where also you have currents and stuff can get in, stuff can get out. And um, also these influences, right? So if you have, for example, in the Baltic Sea, we have uh, seasonality, meaning all the abiotic parameters are changing, substrates are changing that are available for bacteria. Mm-hmm. And um, so substrates yeah. that they can live and feed on, or right? Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. right. Uh, yeah, and actually, so in our study, we had like over four thousand different <laughs> species. Yeah, and overall, right in the in the marine system, I think until now, around forty thousand or over forty thousand bacterial species have been identified. So okay, yeah, this is a lot, right? <laughs> That's wild, yeah. And and you you're trying to. Um, kind of um, show their sh- show their ecological niche or their, yes, th- yes? Yeah, we're trying to make one step in that direction, right? That mm-hmm. we don't, I mean, when we look at all the species, um, what we actually want to see, or what, what is important for us, right, are the ecological functions that are behind of, behind this. Mm-hmm. Or we also talk sometimes about ecosystem services, right? Yeah. So, for example, if we think about bacteria, they are major recyclers. So, mm-hmm. uh, so that's what the ecosystem function uh we, we we talked about before is uh uh yeah for example yeah and or one um, of them yeah. yeah right and also they produce oxygen and mm-hmm. and stuff like that and uh this is also when we think about global change right that is something we want to we want to understand what is yeah. going on with these communities that are so important <laughs> to us yeah and this is why we kind of need to so we have their dynamics over time right we know okay species a is going up species b is going down but mm. we have these many species, so we cannot look at every species mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, one by one. But we actually need something to understand. Okay, how is the how is the ecological function changing if the species are varying in their abundances, yeah. right, or that that time patterns, the dynamics? Yeah. Absolutely. I imagine I um, just because bacteria are so small and I guess hard to research, are they are they often overlooked when it comes to ecosystem functions? Or yeah, I think so. I mean, also the problem is we we kind of just know about uh, got to know about bacteria, right? Because mm-hmm. it's so hard to see them. Also, as you said, it's, uh, oh, we cannot see them and. Um, um just with these new technologies right sequencing for example we can get some insights on them yeah um so the sequencing as is is a genetic uh, technique again so right um, yeah how do you the, the the data set so you you didn't collect them but um in the data set they are just you just have genomes um or what is the data of uh the data is actually amplicon sequence variants oh, okay. which is that you just <laughs> So you take a very conserved region of the, in this case, uh, DNA that is encoding the r- r- ribosome. Yeah. And thereby you can, uh, to a certain degree, identify the species mm-hmm. because you know about the species from uh, sequencing before from databases that it has this specific sequence. And then you can say, ah, this is species A, species B, okay. which also means we just detect the species that we n- already know mm-hmm. that they exist. Yeah. Okay. So I I imagine, um, like we said, it's a very highly dimensional uh, data set that you're dealing with. And what exactly is the manifold learning doing? So so the method you talked about, diffusion maps of the manifold learning category, what is it doing? How does it work? Uh, Yeah, so it uh, kind of detects the variables that explain the variation in the data set. (laughs) So, yeah, basically we have this data set of uh, different bacteria mm-hmm. and then also we have the genes. So, for example, they can they can use glucose or they can do photosynthesis. Mm-hmm. And with this, it kind of finds the metabolic strategies of the bacteria. So it really says, for example, are you a bacteria that lives associated to a host, mm-hmm. right? Then you need certain... You, you you need to be able to to do certain things yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, have certain characteristics uh, right yeah. yeah and um yeah so the method is actually able to detect these different strategies mm-hmm. and um yeah so basically by finding the right variables of the data set so uh if we think about high dimensional data high dimensional data is actually um 
so what is hard about high dimensional data is that if you compare very distant objects it's it's not really clear what what variable we should use to compare them so mm -hmm. yeah for example if we compare different houses right this is kind of an easy task so you can say okay this house has this and this height for example yeah. or these many doors or these many people live in this house mm -hmm. And, but if we think about comparing very distant objects, so for example, if I want to compare a house to a cat or a, a cat to a song, like how, what variables do I use, right? What, mm -hmm. what do I ask? Yeah. And this is what the, what the method finds. It finds these major explanatory variables, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, great. And then, so, so but, but it doesn't name them for you, right? So, so it just tells you there's these many uh, uh, explanatory variables there you go. And then you <laughs> have to interpret this, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, at least it tells you which one is the most important. So which one kind of explains the most variation in the data set, which okay. is good. No? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, then you need some, this is why it's, for example, good to have meta information, right? Mm -hmm. For example, temperature and uh, also in our case, all of these different genes. So we know what the genes might be doing. Mm -hmm. And then we can look, of course, in the taxa eh, or in the species, let's say species, yeah. um, that's, that score extreme values in these variables, mm -hmm. in these new variables, and see, okay, what is probably the strategy that they represent. Mm -hmm. So this is then where the, the brain of the scientist comes in and uh, interprets what the method gives her or, or him um, and, and uh, interprets what makes the most sense, right? Or, or puts, um, so the method tells you, these are the, the explanatory variables and you then interpret what makes the most sense mm -hmm. with the metadata you're given. Yeah, exactly. Or yeah. I use these other information, right, to make yeah. sense of, of what I got from the yeah. diffusion map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the method is only as good as the driver in the end. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But it sounds, it, it sounds very, it sounds almost magic. Yeah, but I think it is. <laughs> yeah. Where has it been? So uh, I, th I think it's been used in a couple of instances already at our institute at the very least. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, Alex Ryabov, right? Yeah, yeah. He used it also to, uh, in a very cool example, so to for uh, quantifying functional diversity, right? Because this is actually kind of... So before, right, you needed to know all these functional traits. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we don't even know all the organisms. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, he did this with phytoplankton, Yeah. Uh, which is also, uh, I think, we have not understood everything yet about <laughs> phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of, from the abundance, from the abundances, um, so how often they, they appear in the samples, mm -hmm. he could uh, use the diffusion map uh, to to quantify functional diversity in the samples. That's wild, without it being in, uh, uh, sampled uh, to begin with. Like, uh, I, I imagine in your case now, the, the time series goes back to where? Like, was it 2011 or? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. nine years. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I imagine they, they haven't uh, recorded traits or, or functional traits or anything whatsoever, but then you are able in hindsight to put something functional on this uh, uh, time series, which is incredible, yeah, incredibly yeah. useful. Yeah. Um, awesome. And, and what have you found? So, so what's the main finding of, of your study? Um, I think, first of all, maybe that this method works. So yeah. okay. uh, because, I mean, for example, what we saw is uh, an important trait was photosynthesis, right? And it also really separated uh, the different bacteria, mm -hmm. which makes sense because for for doing photosynthesis, you need so many different adaptations, right? Mm. If we think, I mean, here on uh, when we are uh, outside the ocean, right? Only plants basically can do it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, um, what we also, f what was also cool, what we saw in the first variable that it identified the pathogens so we uh, we saw all these very nasty pathogens actually actually like uh, relatives to yersinia pestis right which caused the black death and oh, we're wow. like okay what is this doing in the ocean okay. um but it's actually the bias that this method can identify so of course we as humans are much more interested in in pathogenic tux taxa or uh, like yeah. like bacteria that can cause us harm mm -hmm. basically and this is why we know much more about them and so our databases are full of them and so this method detected this bias mm -hmm. um 
yeah and i hope i i, I hope that we show that uh we get one step further to understanding this community dynamics so so how the the bacteria fluctuate over time yeah more in terms of okay what does it mean for the system right if we have different strategies that go up and down mm -hmm. um um yeah and then how, how this also links to ecosystem functioning which right yeah which was one of the one of the things we said in the beginning cool so this method works where are you going to apply it next <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> let's see. Yeah. I think there's a lot to do with this method. Yeah. But uh, in this case, actually, I hope that, um, or I mean that the ideal data for, for us would have been to really get the genomes from from the place, right? Because what we now did, we mapped our, uh, so we knew that species A, right? And we mapped mm -hmm. this to a, to a database. Mm -hmm. And I hope with now these new sequencing te technologies and so on that we really can get the, the 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 species from the system and their genome because there are of course variations between. Also, uh, bacteria are very complicated, so there's also variation yeah. in between species, and um, yeah, that would be great to then go even deeper, right, and mm -hmm. and see okay, what what does what does for example uh, special to the Baltic Sea yeah. microbiome? Yeah. Okay. And and just maybe maybe for the listener to make it more visual, like how do you how do you apply this method? I, I read in your CV that you are versed in the programming language Julia. Programming languages like uh, R, Julia, so, so R the letter are, are all languages that you type into your computer. Basically, you type uh, a certain phrase into your computer, and the, your computer uh, understands it. And then makes a statistical thing out of it, does an action out of it. Julia, I think, is one of the ones that I've heard most associated with mathematicians and, and seems to be the most cutting edge of them currently. Have you, how, how long have you spent learning this language and, and using it, it? Yeah, so actually I, had, hadn't, I had, hadn't, had not done a lot of programming before my PhD. So right. I basically started off with Julia, with, which was kind of good. I mean, I had done some things in R. I think a lot of biologists use R. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, th I, I, I love Julia because it is just, <laughs> you can write things like you think them, right? So yeah. um, um, I think there are these, these programming languages where you always need to define, for example, different types mm -hmm. and so on. So then it, it, it can only... Uh, for example, if it, it needs to calculate something, it needs to know what, what is the type, the data type. So, for example, like an integer or a float yeah. or whatever. Right? Yeah. And Julia is very flexible and just tries to do whatever you, you put in. Oh, right. So this is pretty cool and it's very efficient. So it's as fast as C, I think. Mm -hmm. And C is very hard to program. Oh, right. uh, but, okay. uh, yeah, so it, it kind of is easy to write, but it's also fast. Um, okay. Yeah. And just for visualization, so it looks, uh, at least R looks a little bit like when you open the console on your computer and then you type something in. Does Julia look the same? It's just a, a console or? Uh, yeah, I think it looks very similar to yeah. R. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. That's how the magic works. That's how the magic <laughs> happens. Okay. And since we've, we're already talking about your CV, let's get into that as you, in, in, into you as, a, as an academic. So uh, your academic career kind of started in 2014. Uh, in Münster, Germany, and uh, you started as a bachelor in bioscience. And I was wondering what, what, how, how, how does that compare to biology? What's the difference? Yeah, it's, I think it's just more chemistry and physics. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. I I was always already interested in marine biology, but I thought I start out a bit a little more broad because I was not so sure. Mm -hmm. And I think it was actually good that uh, to have also this basic understanding right of chemistry and physics right uh, but it was of course it's a tough coming from from school right yeah. where you i feel like you don't really learn uh, so much yeah. <laughs> in, in depth yeah but it was a good experience it was uh, i learned a lot of different stuff i think and it also got me interested in so many different things yeah, yeah. did you enjoy it uh yes mostly yeah <laughs> And you did it at the, I, I just saw that, you did it at the Institute of Evolution and Biodiversity. Did you, did you know that you're going to end up working with biodiversity? No, I no. did not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then you moved to Bremen, um, where I did my master's as well. I did the same master's uh, study, uh, uh, wait, three, four years before you. And um, so it's the master's of marine biology at the University of Bremen. Right. 
and uh, you worked uh, specifically uh, with the upwelling Humboldt current in in Peru mm -hmm. in your thesis. Did you did you get to go to Peru? Yes, I went to no, kind of right. I was on in like on the ocean yeah. in front of Peru. <laughs> I, I n was never in Peru. All oh, right, you didn't. So, okay. No, actually, like we flew to Panama mm -hmm. and we went uh, went onto the um, research vessel in Panama crossed the Panama Canal and then yeah. went uh, like to the Humboldt current system and then uh, to Chile. So Was yeah. it a German research vessel? or? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. which, which one? Uh, the Mirian. Oh, okay. Uh, Don't know mm -hmm. that one. Okay. I, I thought maybe it's one like the Polarstern or Sonne or... No, no, no. no. Okay. And uh, so you then work with uh, food web structure and, and trophic interactions. Um, like uh, analyzing the entire food web or yeah or we part? tried <laughs> yeah <Okay. laughs> so we use stable isotope and uh, fatty acid analysis mm -hmm. um to look into the food web structure and that means you just basically need a little piece of every organism okay. right so everything we could get our hands on we uh, kind of got us ourselves a piece <laughs> and <laughs> analyzed and with this you can kind of see on which position the the organisms are in the food web. A little bit like eDNA, like uh, environmental DNA. We talked about it in, I think, I don't know, uh, episode three or something. Uh, I think it's a bit different because it's telling you more. So basically, um, I mean, you have like this, uh, the basis of the food web, like, for example, phytoplankton, which is eaten then by, for example, copper pods and mm -hmm. so on. And this level like if you are on the basic level or uh, one level higher or even one level higher or if you are like a top predator this you can kind of approximately determine with th with this but i guess with edna you can you can get even more insights yeah right okay and uh i, I just saw in your publications record as well that you uh last year actually published the the um publication that goes along with your with that cruise right yeah, yeah. did you get to write it during your phd or, or yeah, kind of <laughs> it was kind of stressful, so I had to finish it in the I first year of my PhD. I where bet, yeah. I had to, yeah. Also, I had to learn a lot of new stuff, of course. Yeah, yeah okay. but I still wanted to, so I thought we had some nice insights and I wanted to write the paper. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and, and, and I really like the, the start of the title, To What a Solution of the Peruvian Puzzle. And I was wondering, what's the, what's the puzzle? Uh, yeah, so the, the Humboldt current system is one of the four eastern boundary upwelling systems. Okay which is kind of, sp so it's special because uh, due to uh, specific currents, ocean currents, nutrients are coming up and this means it's a very productive system because it has so much mm -hmm. nutrients kind of energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other systems have the same, uh, the same phenomena with the currents and also actually the same uh, amount of primary production, but the Peruvian system is five to eight times higher in fisheries yield. And we were wondering like, mm -hmm. wow, why, why is this happening? And as we know, the prime production is the same, right? And kind of the, the output is the same. So the fish, or it, I mean, it's more, but uh, the, the, the kind of output. Yeah. We, we, we thought that, okay, it must be in the structure, right? Uh, so in between. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, th this was actually the case. So it, uh, what we found was that it's, um, much, it's a much simpler system. So basically you channel all the energy towards the, towards the fish. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then, uh, so this was your your um, master's thesis being finished. Then you uh, went into the PhD at uh, HFMB. How did you, like, did you did that spark? Did the working on the food web structure and trophic interactions did that kind of spark your interest in in these theory, in in, in into the theory thinking part? And then you applied for for the position or. Yeah, I think uh, there are two main reasons for yeah. this uh, transition. Okay. So first, uh, for my master's thesis, I had a lot of data, right? As I said, we collected like yeah. piece pieces of everything we could get our oh, hands yeah, on. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, how long was the cruise in, in Peru? Uh, six weeks. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of data to collect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then kind of I felt like, okay, we are missing tools to really analyze the system, right? I mean, we, we of course plotted the data and stuff like that and did some statistical analysis, mm -hmm. but I felt like, okay, this is so much data and I, I, I feel like I have to do more with this, right? We, we, qual we did all this effort and now I really want to understand what is going on in the system and I, will, uh, I want to have tools to, to analyze the data. Mm -hmm. And this is actually 
when I read the PhD, like the position, the job posting of the, this PhD position I'm now in, uh, I was like, okay, this is uh, what I want to, what I always ask myself, right? Is, is there are tools, uh, tools for this. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was that I was in this, um, uh, in this winter school on ocean governance and our mm -hmm. director, our now director, right? So Helmut was there and he was talking about uh, biodiversity. Yeah. And before that, I, I, of course, knew about biodiversity, but he had he gave such an interesting talk that I I got interested in the HFMB, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, in this biodiversity theory and modeling stuff. And and but uh, because you mentioned the winter school um, for ocean governance, are you also interested, or were you uh, also interested in in ocean governance? And and so this is quite a lot of fields that you're tapping into. Yeah, there are many things I'm interested yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's very hard to decide. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> no, but I think also everything you... So it was just an opportunity that came up because I was working at the ZMT at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, they yeah, had the, the so ocean... So sorry, school. just... Uh, sorry. Uh, the, the Leibniz... The ZMT is the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research by now, right? Or Did uh, it change? I don't know. I think it was yeah. Tropical Marine Ecology at one point okay. and now it's research. I yeah, think. it could be. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, I just wanted to say that. I think uh, um, it's just nice to always get these new perspectives from whatever side, yeah. And yeah. yeah, but I don't know what I, what, where I will end up. <laughs> How long was the winter school? Um, I think it was only like two weeks. Okay, all right. Do you see yourself going back to ocean governance or, or going into it more? Mm, oh, I'm, I'm not sure because I... Um, I haven't done anything in that direction, I would say. Right. But I think it's very important, and maybe, I I mean, I would see, I I, I would like to collaborate with those people if there is any anything I could do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with the with the governance group here, for sure. There's there's going to be opportunities. Yeah, yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Okay. And um, yeah. Now 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 since we're kind of already um talking about about your other endeavors that you've that you've tapped into you also um you're one of the hosts of uh wissenschaft fürs wohnzimmer um a, a series that was it always on youtube i think so yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. so, so yeah it's a series that is uh on youtube interviewing um various scientists from is it only alfred wegener institute and no no, no. it's all kind of institutions all oh, right mm -hmm. okay And uh, yeah, I, I got interviewed uh, as well at some point, I think in episode, oh God, 100 and something, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I guess. I, I, yeah. <laughs> how, did, how, how did that start? Or, or how did it come up? Were you, were you involved in the, in the beginning? No, I was not involved in the beginning, but uh, it kind of started, I think, with Corona. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so maybe one good thing from this. Like <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, I think... I mean, before, for example, there was this uh, Science Goes Public, right, where, mm -hmm. where scientists went in, into pubs and, and just talked about their, their science yeah. there. And then uh, during cor Corona, I think the, the people that started that were like, okay, now we cannot do this stuff anymore, but science communication is so important, especially with yeah. all the issues yeah. we have right now. And that's why they started to just say, okay, why don't we have this on YouTube? And uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Sweet. Are you one of, of three hosts, right? Or, or oh, no, no, no. There are more people involved. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah, I think they are like, oh, I don't know, maybe like eight to ten regular people. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Do you see yourself in, in doing more science communication stuff? or? Uh, so at the moment, I don't have so much time, right? Because yeah. I'm kind of finishing my PhD. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think it's really important and I also really enjoy it. And I think sometimes you can get even... Uh, even these really cool insights from people that have nothing to do with your mm -hmm. with your science, right? W yeah. Which is also so cool. I, I think the questions asked are sometimes so so good. Um, and yeah, no, I, I hope definitely to continue somehow working or, or somehow doing science communication. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Since you mentioned you're you're kind of finishing, um, how how much time do you have left on your PhD? <laughs> Uh, so my contract ends in October. Okay, all right. <laughs> Do you have anything uh, on the horizon or, or where would you like to go next? Yeah, that is what I 
fi- should now figure out. And <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, no <laughs> pressure. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. But I have so many things that are that I find interesting, right? And mm-hmm. but I, I think I definitely want to continue to work interdisciplinary because this is what I enjoyed most mm-hmm. now in my PhD, right? Working with so many different people and learning yeah. like all these new tools, which is also yeah, it's also hard, but it also is is. I think so cool so it gives you new perspectives on the problems like for example before right I was like oh with with this practical work it's more like you try to go then you try to measure the system as yeah as as specific or as in detail as you can yeah. and with modeling I had to like completely throw this overboard <laughs> and be like like you cannot uh, um you, you cannot uh, so if you represent the system as complicated as it is you will not get any new insights right to yeah. so you need to simplify but as a biologist i was always like but this is missing in the model oh, yeah but we we need to simplify and then we can hopefully get some insights from this right mm-hmm. yeah yeah wow okay but uh, i i mean it looks like since you've kind of uh, tapped into so many uh, different fields in in such a short amount of time and you've kind of done a, a very good job of it like um from my perspective I think you're gonna do just fine in your wherever you go next. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Is it gonna be? But it sounds like it's gonna be science. Y- you're happy with science? Uh, yeah, well, I'm excited about science. But yeah. um, I guess I will also. I I mean, like I said, with the science communication, I also like and also mm-hmm. sometimes I think about working in an NGO, right? So uh, yeah, right. yeah, I'm I'm not sure yet. Cool. <laughs> It'll get old. Exciting stuff ahead yeah. for Jana. <laughs> So. cool okay that's th- uh, uh we're already at the uh, 33 minute mark and um i think that's all from my side is there anything um that you want to mention that we haven't uh, mentioned or that we've that you think we've missed uh anything left no thanks <laughs> okay. thanks a lot i think the only thing that i sometimes think that when i would start my phd again i would I would like me to have more more courage. So I think mm-hmm. uh, if you start, especially diving into completely new fields, right? I think at first you're like, oh my god, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. But I I would say you can do it. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's that's perfect words to end on. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Cheers. Bye bye, everyone. Want to dive deeper? Surf over to hifmb.de or follow us on Twitter at hifmb underscore oh well.